Well, I'm sure Miss Kevin. <laughs> no, I, I do what you do. When they're gone, they leave a big hole in the audience. <laughs> Same with that salmon spot, too. When they're gone, she leaves a pretty good uh, bacon spot in it. Kevin's actually flying back today, but he may not get back in time for services this evening. I think the plane lands up almost 5 o'clock down in Tampa. So, anyway, he'll be back tonight, but maybe not here. <coughs> All right, before we begin, um, Joe, would you come up? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be able to be here today, to have the health and freedom to be here to worship you. Father, we're mindful of those that are not able to be with us and pray that you would care and comfort them. Father, we're thankful for this church that assembles here and comes together to encourage and exhort one another, and we pray that you continue to bless us. Ask you, Father, to be with those that cannot be here and help us to be a help to them. Please be with Wayne as he presents a lesson to us this morning that uh, it might be presented away, we'll make it more applicable to our lives, and help us, Father, to be better stewards of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the, uh, the author of the book kind of continues his thought in the first paragraph there. It says, the mountain message, uh, which is, Sermon on the Mount, stands alone as the greatest and most powerful discourse Jesus ever gave. Well, I don't know for sure if, if Jesus would agree with all that, but anyway, it is very comprehensive, and uh, as he goes on to say, it contains the totality of his teaching, the essence of all that he would communicate over the next three years, uh, it contains heaven's secret for life contentment and has universal application for all people at all times. The message was different than what they were used to hearing from the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and, and the Sadducees, all the prominent, if you will, people who were uh, basically just looking down on average people or the, the lower class as they might have looked at them. But it's again, they were very, very pompous and self-righteous. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, as some Jesus pointed out in some of the parables. And so Jesus' teaching came and was basically speaking to the people as to what kind of attitude you ought to have instead of like, did you tie that spice that you got the other day? Or did you, you know, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees were just monitoring every little action that people did. But their hearts were not right, and the people deep down knew it. Um, he goes on to say that if the followers of Jesus expected the typical hypocritical pontification of religious rhetoric, as they were used to hearing, they were pleasantly surprised. Instead, they heard one reaching out to them, combining human compassion with heaven's love. They listened with amazement, and they were amazed at his teaching. Um, he, uh, the first verse in, in Matthew 5 says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. 
And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then the verse we're working to look on today. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, he says, once again, in the middle of the page there, that note the progressive steps of salvation. Step number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who understand their impoverished and helpless state. We're lost, and there's nothing we can do about it ourselves. We empty ourselves out and like, I'm lost. I'm going to be condemned. What can I do? And there's no real answer. So it's blessed are the poor in spirit, but they just realize how destitute they are. They're bankrupt. Uh, they're lost and no way to actually do anything in themselves in order to be saved. And then number two, blessed are those who mourn, those who weep over their lost condition and sin. And that includes sorrowfulness for sinning against God. It's not just like sorrowfulness because I'm lost, sorrowfulness because I'm going to be condemned, but sorrow, a godly sorrow that is indicative of being sorry that we've sinned against God. And uh, and then the step number three, blessed are the meek, those who respond humbly to God's call with a disposition of heart that says, thy will be done. And so meekness, he goes on to say, um, <clears throat> it may be the most misunderstood of all because in the kind of world we live in, we need to be strong, and it's, uh, he says that seemingly only the strong survive. Meekness appears the quickest way to get run over and ripped off or trampled. Uh, someone summed it up this way. The rain falls on the just and the unjust because the unjust steals the just umbrella. Uh, basically, <laughs> the unjust just walk all over them the just and if you're nice the bad guys will run over you uh, so it's hard to be meek if you will in the kind of world that we live in because uh, look at what they did to Paul when he was trying to preach and look what he what they did to Peter and John they arrested them and they uh, threatened them and, and uh, well, they, they even uh, tried to kill Paul uh, there were a lot of things that the world did to those who were just only trying to serve God. Uh, on page 17 at the top, it, it, he talks about the worldview of meekness, and that is that meekness is weakness. The idea of meekness is associated with weakness, spineless, and cowardice. Uh, and he goes on to kind of talk about, can you imagine the coach of the Cowboys or the Steelers or the Packers or whatever football team you want to, giving this speech to his players. What we need for this football team to reach success are more meek players. Can you imagine a coach saying that? Um, the only thing is, although you won't hear that speech, in truth, he would be right. Uh, meekness does not mean weakness, but rather has as its root the idea of strength to discipline. And I think in a sense, team sports, does teach people to be meek in, in the respect that they're a team and they're working together. It's not all about me, it's about the team. And so without saying it that way, in a sense they do teach a certain kind of meekness, the fact that um, it's not all about you. If you're the quarterback or the star uh, receiver, whatever position you might be in, you need to when it's somebody else's turn to take the ball, it's their turn, and then and team works with them. So I think, in a sense, they do teach that. They just won't say it that way. But probably because the word meek is not going to generate the kind of thought process that they need. Uh, those are tough guys. <laughs> they run into each other all the time. And, and uh, I remember one player, they said that, after every game, he was bruised all over, which I don't doubt they got a lot of bruises. But anyway, um, 
He says meekness does not mean weakness, um, but rather it has its root idea of strength through discipline. So we don't mentally associate meekness with strength. But let's go ahead and look at what he, uh, he goes on to say about meekness. In God's view, under point B there, meekness means you're teachable. I don't already know it all. The humble man is the one who allows himself to be taught. He allows the Lord to lead his life. James says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. So if you're not meek, you won't receive the word. Meekness means you're ready to listen to the word and let it guide you, let it shape you, and let the word of God bring you to the place you ought to be. Um, so in, um, he goes on to give the example of Mary in Luke 1, in verse 38, <clears throat> uh, Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And so this is uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she was kind of um, taken back a little bit, if you will, when um, the angel announced to her that she's going to give birth to the Savior, but she said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. In other words, use me. I'm, I'm just going to be what you want me to be. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to. Uh, so that's the attitude that she had there. Uh, number two is lowly. Uh, not arrogant, not proud, not full of himself. Um, the meek man is the one that emptied himself, of, emptied himself of self and filled up instead with God. Uh, Self-inflation, selfishness, and arrogance are foreign to the one who sees himself as a servant. Um, and number three is gentle. Um, how well do you get two people you're trying to convince if you're harsh and, and rough and coarse and overbearing uh, and also come at it with the attitude of, uh, you don't know anything, but I do. I know everything. Listen to me. You know, uh, some people might say, you're a sinner, you're lost, and you're no good. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other Jewish leaders did. They, they would refer to people that Jesus ate with as sinners. You were eating with sinners. Well, I brought up the example last week of the, the uh, woman who was brought to Jesus who had been caught in adultery. And he said, well, okay, who's without, who is without sin cast the first stone? And so they all realized that they were sinners. Um, <clears throat> Paul urges us with meekness and gentleness of Christ uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 1. And meekness is the opposite of harshness. Um, and patience is another one. Um, who will inherit the land? Uh, those who wait for the Lord. And who are they? But the humble will inherit the land. Meekness and patience go together. He refers to Psalm 37, verse 9. Uh, those who wait for the Lord. Meekness is not asking something to the Lord and then five minutes later wondering why he hasn't done it yet. <laughs> we realize that God's going to do it in his time. And so we acknowledge that his time is the best time, not on our schedule necessarily. We think things need to happen right now or on our schedule, but God has his own schedule. So that's meekness too, is, is trusting in God that his way is right, his time is right, and so forth. Anybody have any thoughts or comments so far? Yes, sir. Number five on blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. We should know that that earth inheritance is nothing for a child of God. Our inheritance is in heaven. And what we do is through our meekness, and I go back and think about the uh,
it's amazing um, how when an animal is trained properly, they have the power to run over you, run away, do what they want to do, but they meekly submit to your commands, and and that's in a good example of of how we are with God. We we have the ability to go and do whatever we want to do. We can be what we want to be if we want to. But meekness is deciding that I'm going to be what God wants me to be. And the next point he brings up is that meekness is strength under control. And so rather than impulsively doing what you think you ought to do, we stop and we think about what God wants us to do. And it takes strength to do that. In fact, <clears throat> overcoming our own way of doing things, or our own way of thinking, and adopting God's will as our will, and doing what God wants, takes time to, to grow and get stronger where we can, and, and there were, the key word there is stronger, it takes strength to align yourself with what God wants us to be, Mary. I heard um, something that says, well, I'm not arguing, I'm just explaining why I'm right. <laughs> but that's the attitude, is like, well, I'm right and I want to prove it. And so that that is a little bit of the thought process, though. I'm, I'm not arguing, I'm just explaining why I'm right, you know, which is another way of saying you're wrong. <laughs> but that's not, that's not gentleness, that's not patience, and it's also self-inflation, if you will. So, yeah, um, argue, if people argue with God, uh, not literally face-to-face, -face, but they'll see what God says and they think, well, this would be better or it would be better if I did this or, you know, and they come up with their own ideas and think it's better than God's way. But in the Old Testament, we saw a lot of times when people thought they would do something a different way and what happened? <laughs> Remember when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire? They thought that was okay. And there were a lot of different things that they thought would be okay. And there's so many examples in the Old Testament. But they were not willing to check with God first before they went into battle sometimes. And there were a lot of things they came up with. But anyway, the, uh, the example of the horse that Earl was talking about, he goes on to say the original term describing uh, described uh, the taming of a wild animal. Um, it speaks of discipline, strength that is harnessed. Um, and he goes on, and he says, I think of a beautiful Tennessee walking horse, possessing all the qualities of a thoroughbred racehorse, yet able to high step and change gates at a simple command of the rider. That is meekness, it's strength under control. I have seen people riding horses and they had them do amazing things and the cue that they gave the horse to change from one thing to another is so subtle that people watching can't even pick it up but the horse does. It's just uh, strength under control. Horses are very powerful. I've been around them. Julie's been around quite a few too. Uh, but they are very, very powerful. But when they, they get a desire to listen to you and do what you want with, with a few exceptions <laughs> but it's amazing how they come around and they are so uh, attuned to what the rider wants that all it takes is just a most subtle cue for the horse to change what they're doing and it's an amazing thing to watch but we need to be attuned to what God desires for us to do in the same manner um, Christ also was Christ's image of God. He, Christ had all the strength he wanted. Uh, and he could have called 10,000 angels. <laughs> absolutely. Um, then he goes on uh, down at uh, the bottom of the page. Blessed are the meek or the gentle. Doesn't mean one who is spineless or passive, but one who has placed himself under the control of God. It is an attitude of heart that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant hears. Uh, Jesus, he kind of paraphrasing here, he says, I'm looking for disciples like that. I search for those who are humble and disciplined, those willing to let go and let God do the leading and training. 
So we put ourselves in God's hands, and there's no better place that we can put ourselves. Um, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends of thereof are destruction. So we have a lot of ideas on our own, don't we? <laughs> Mankind. Um, but we just have to realize that when we submit to God and do His will, we're better off. Uh, and he blesses us much more than we can possibly serve him. Um, he talks about that show, a lot of us might remember, The Incredible Hulk. Uh, the storyline was a, a normal man who, once he prov was provoked, turned into a raging power within. Uh, it was a picture of one out of control and bursting with emotional rage. And that is the opposite picture of meekness or discipline. Uh, it's amazing to see that kind of power, you know, but when you see uh, other shows, there were people who showed someone who was not, even though they had great power, they didn't use it for anything for their own purpose. I used to watch Superman. Well, he was a mild-mannered reporter, you know, until it was needed, and then he came to the rescue. Well, he only used his power, if you will, for helping other people. So anyway, there's, there's different television shows and different storylines throughout uh, our experience. Um, he goes on to talk about three examples of biblical meekness. Um, in Numbers 12, and verse 3, when did Moses, uh, he has a question, when did Moses become the meekest man in all the earth? Um, Numbers 12, 3 says Moses was the meekest man. Uh, and the answer is when God finally got him trained or tamed, um, Moses was hardly a cowardly sissy, but was in fact a man's man. The problem is he wasn't God's man. When Moses finally stopped seeking his way, he became humble. Um, Actually, in my lesson this morning, when I'm, when I'm preaching, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, about uh, what kind of man Moses was before he began doing what God wanted. Uh, and then Simon Peter, uh, he would think he was ought, ought to do something, and he was impulsive and just do it. He was not under control. He was didn't have self-control. He just was uh, like ready to just blurt out or act really quickly. Uh, he's considered very impulsive. Uh, <clears throat> he goes on to say, if ever a man was stood as the antithesis to meekness and humility, it was Simon Peter. He was impetuous and impulsive more often than not. Uh, you see him in the garden as he pulls his sword out, cuts off the ear of the high priest. Um, and uh, if the Lord... Uh, but he was also ready to die with Jesus to keep them from taking Jesus away. He was ready to fight to the death. Um, if the Lord had not intervened, he would have received this wish. He probably, because they had, they brought basically soldiers with them and they, they were ready to take Jesus by force, although they didn't need to. Um, <clears throat> although there were flashes of courage, he says, Peter was often undisciplined and, and out of control. He didn't exactly uh, hold back and think about things and uh, let himself be guided by what Jesus wanted him to do. But in Acts, uh, uh, go ahead, Alana. Yes, and, and there's meekness in submitting to one another. Uh, and in a sense, when somebody needs help because they're out of control or because they uh, need a little discipline or training or whatever you might call it, to be patiently uh, working with them and having compassion on them and not, you know, 
kind of shove something down their throat, if you will, or you know, beat them into submission, uh, or, or correct them in a harsh way. We use patience and love to help somebody else who's not self-disciplined the way they ought to be yet. Um, it's self-control, it's discipline, it's also submission. Uh, Ephesians talks about submitting to one another in love. Um, so that's, um, where, uh, Paul was very, uh, kind and considerate to people. He seemed like a harsh man because he'd been through so much and he at one time was actually going and arresting people. And he was at one time very harsh in trying to stifle the church and stifle is called the way sometimes. He was determined to wipe it out, if you will. But then when he became a Christian, he started living the kind of life that actually Jesus is talking about in the Beatitudes. He uh, was poor in spirit when he, when he realized what he had done, what he had been doing. Um, and he was meek, if you will. He put himself out there in danger and he spent all of his time and he was praying for the churches even when he wasn't there and he talked about all the things he had been through and then he said and also daily the care for all the churches so he was thinking about all of the people who he had preached to and the churches he had started as he went through his ministry uh, <clears throat> but peter in acts we see a different man than we saw back in in the gospels he uh, was threatened and beaten and thrown into prison. Uh, he was carried before the council and they threatened him and says, don't preach in this name anymore. But he refused to be silenced. He showed courage and strength. Uh, he says, it says that out of control, Simon was becoming the rock like Peter the Lord had envisioned. Um, then he goes on after he was threatened by the council, he says, in Acts 5, 29, we must obey God rather than man, and that's meekness. Like, I am not defying you as much as I am serving God. Because you want me to stop doing what I have to do. I can't do anything but speak what God has uh, told me to say, I need to obey God. And basically he's telling them that that's what you need to do too, and not so many words, but he says, I'm obeying God in doing this. And so that is a, a kind of a revelation to them that they need to obey God too. He said, I'm obeying God, you're not, but not so many words. <clears throat> uh, remember James and John, remember what their mother wanted? What, what did she want? One sit on the right hand, one on the left. Uh, they were actually referred to as the sons of thunder. Doesn't exactly sound meek, does it? <laughs> um, have placed, they placed themselves under heaven's direction uh, by the time they get into Acts. Uh, while the two brothers already had the courage, they lacked the discipline. But in Acts 12, James dies for Jesus, and then John was later banished to Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, for his faith. Uh, so the sons of thunder had learned the meaning or blessed are the gentle or the meek. Now remember Moses, before God called him to lead the people out of Israel, he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of his fellow Israelites and he killed that Egyptian for it. So he had strength. He was not exactly a wuss, if, if you will. Peter had the courage to draw the sword and actually fight. And James and John um, had the grit to destroy anyone refusing to listen to Jesus. They, they kind of wanted to like force people into it, if you will. Um, so what was missing is neatness or strength under control. You need strength, but you have to have it controlled. Um, and on page 19, Jesus says, I am meek and lowly in heart, or humble in heart. Uh, the same meek Jesus is the one also that made a skirt of cords and 
random money changers out of the temple. Apparently, he didn't have much difficulty doing it either. So he wasn't like this weakling that uh, was not able to do that kind of thing. He was able to go in and actually literally drive these people out of the temple. Um, he says uh, there was not a single one of those merchants who was able to actually stand up against him and, and not flee. They all fled before him. Um, he says this was no meek and spineless preacher in sandals. Uh, we picture Jesus walking around in sandals and never doing anything except talking and, and uh, you know, kind of a meek or weak. I have to watch mixing the terms because I don't really want to do that. A, a weakling, if you will. And, um, but he was not uh, a wuss, I guess you would say. He had, was a man of courage, or the Son of God, of course, but he always remained in control. Uh, it's been said that the depth of a man's meekness is gauged in direct proportion to his ability to crush his adversary. Um, a lot of people who practice martial arts will not use it unless really, really provoked. They have it in reserve and not having the confidence that you could do certain things and yet not doing it is self-control. It's, it's keeping your strength under control. Um, <clears throat> Jesus could have killed all of those people who came up against him if he wanted. He could have just uh, said the word. Uh, because his strength was disciplined. He was, Jesus was not meek because he was powerless, but his unlimited power was actually under control. So that is meekness. But when you really get down and look at it, being able to control yourself and put you yourself in the place where God wants takes strength and discipline. And to not react harshly or with all the strength that you have in an improper way, resisting that urge actually exhibits strength. Um, <clears throat> under point B there in the middle of the page, finally our Lord allowed godless men to berate him verbally, spit in his face, nail him to a cross. He could have exercised his power and called down legions of angels, as we said before, to rescue him. He did not. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, uttered no threats. Jesus was willing to submit to heaven's will. And that is the third beatitude, what the third beatitude is all about. What did he say often? Not my will, but thine be done. But also he said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. There are just so many cases where he said, I am here to do the will of the Father. He meekly submitted himself and always deferred to the Father rather than himself, even though he is God, he's the Son of God. Um, <clears throat> and then he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's Philippians 2 and verse 8. Um, he goes on to say, while every man feels the raging power within, the meek man, God's man, controls it. We all have the ability to do something. And sometimes we, if we don't act out against anybody else, we act out against the weakest members. Sometimes our people even act out against their own children. I don't know why they're so impulsive and destructive to their own kids, but that happens. But using self-control is very, very much needed in, in disciplining and training your children. Uh, sometimes it helps to remember that you were once there. You know, some people recall how, what kind of kids they were like, and they need to remember that when they're disciplining their own. Uh, he says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, another word for me. The future does not belong to the ruthless power grabbers or the self-willed, my way or the highway, but to those whose lives are brought only under the control of God. So inheriting the earth is basically at the end of everything, you're successful, while all those who are harsh and rude, they're, they actually fail. I think that's as close as I understand, that the only way to success is God's way, 
ultimate success. Uh, a lot of people are power hungry, self-willed, all in it for themselves, and they feel like they've succeeded when they can do this and do that, and, and you know, maybe build a business and, and run it and make a lot of money, but they forget God. Uh, they exercise their power to do one thing when they should be exercising their self-control and their ability to actually serve God. Yeah, it, uh, there are a lot of passages in the scripture that, that talk about the ultimate end for those who serve God and are faithful to the end. Uh, I know the letters to the seven churches of Asia that quite often says to him that overcomes. Well, what does it take to overcome something? One of the hardest things to overcome is your own will, your own stubbornness, your own um, desire to do things that, that you might not that might not uh, be pleasing to God. Um, so he goes on and he says the progression again, empty heart, a blessed the poor in spirit, a shameful heart, those who mourn, and an humble heart, blessed are the meek. Um, Terry? timidness. It's not fearful. It's not uh, afraid to do anything or don't do anything because you're afraid that what you do is going to be wrong. It's confidence because you submit to God because you know that's what's right. You know that if you do this, it's going to be pleasing to God and you're controlling yourself by the Word of God. You're using the Word of God to control your actions. If somebody's listening to Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit, and they're not already poor in spirit, it takes action to actually become one who is poor in spirit. Uh, and the same thing when you think of one who has, has sinned and they realize that they've sinned against God, some people are like, oh well. And other people have this mournful spirit, this sorrowfulness for what they've done. And if you're arrogant and proud and you think your way is the best way um, and you hear Jesus say that you need to be meek, you've got some work to do. You've got, you got a lot cut out for you to get done if you have, are not the way Jesus is talking about here. So there is action required there. Um, <clears throat> Basically, meekness is deciding to do it God's way, and to, or in other words, to do God's will and not my own. Um, how does the world usually define meekness? This is on digging deeper on, on uh, page 20 here. Usually, if the world thinks of somebody as meek, I think I've heard the expression years ago, meek as a mouse, uh, you know, pretty harmless, uh, and in every time something scares them. Um, see, it's almost time. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> um, and about the football coach he talked about, uh, we kind of realized that we, we do for God instead of ourselves. 
And if somebody on the team is actually practicing good teamwork, they're doing it for the team and not for themselves, not for their own glory. Although we know some of those guys are pretty arrogant, but still, um, in some practices, they they forgive themselves and they're doing things for the team if, if it's a good team. Um, <clears throat> how are we to receive the truth of God according to James twenty one, James one twenty one? Absolutely. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Uh, and of course, he goes on to say, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Um, so basically, when you hear what the word of God is and you realize that what you ought to do, meekness is submitting to God's will. It's putting yourself aside and uh, deciding to do the very will of God. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth, Numbers 12 and verse 3. Was Moses meek when he killed the Egyptian in a fit of rage? Not exactly, no. Um, was uh, he meek when he sat on the Judean hillside watching sheep for 40 years? Remember, he was in Midian, and he, he was there for a long time. Um, was he meek when he offered God one excuse after another uh, as to why he wasn't the one? No, that's not meekness. That's timidness. That's uh, rejecting actually what God wanted him to do. He was actually rejecting that. Um, <clears throat> so Moses... When he finally decided to do what God said that he ought to do, that was when he became meek. And then from then on, he uh, was just strictly there to do God's will. Um, and of course, we had the changes in Peter and James and John. And I would also throw in the change that was in Paul himself. He wasn't meek when he was throwing people in prison, was he? I don't, I don't think that's the way anybody would describe him when he was actively hunting down Christians and, and throwing them in prison and assenting to their deaths. Remember, he, he wasn't meek when he was standing there watching Stephen be in stone and they laid their garments at his feet. He, he was not meek at all. Um, what other kind of changes happened in, in those who finally submitted to God? What, What's, uh, how would you describe the change over time? Hmm? Learned obedience. For one thing. Obedience, um, but it's also growing in faith. The more you trust in the fact that God's way is the best way, the easier it is to submit to His way. The more we understand that it, it's not just serving God, but it's actually benefiting us uh, because we love God and do His will. And he has made it possible for us to be saved. We grow in faith and strength, and we also submit ourselves more easily to God. I uh, remember Naaman when uh, the servant of the prophet went out and said, "Go dip in the river Jordan seven times, and your leprosy will go away." He's like, "Well, I got a better idea than that. We got better rivers than the Jordan, you know." And um, his meek servant said. Well, if he told you to do some great thing, you would have done it, right? How much easier it is, is it to go and just dip in this river seven times, see what happens? Um, I think a lot of people in the world today, if they would just see what happens if they follow God's word, they, they would realize how good it is. Um, all right. First statement wants you to God's way or the hell way. What's that now? God's way or the hell way. Yeah, it, it's uh, definitely God's way or uh, the consequences. Terry? Uh, I, I, I'm still thinking about Moses because he would go on to deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians, but not in Moses' timing and not in Moses' way. Mm -hmm. And in God's time and God's way, he's doing the same thing before and after God calls him. But we have to do it God's way, even the right thing at the And how much, how much more effective was it when he did it God's way? It was effective. 
<laughs> yeah, and, uh, and and of course the, uh, the Pharaoh was the opposite of being meek. He uh, had to let his people go through a lot of things before he let people go. Um, so he goes on to say, meekness is seen when one allows himself to be led by the Lord, and hence the song we know this song, less of self and more of thee. And then uh, he goes into James 4 and verse 6, says, but he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But he also goes on in verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So I think that's a good place to finish there on this lesson.